Welcome to Worship at Highland on this beautiful morning. I'm grateful to see you. I'm Abby Calhoun, and I'm the worship leader here. And we've got a wonderful hour planned um, to worship and give the, give the Lord all the glory and honor that he deserves through music and the reading of his word. And so I'm grateful that you have chosen to be a part of that. Would you stand, please, as we begin and sing Impossible Things? Great day to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today here at Highland. Uh, for those of you whom I may not have had the opportunity to meet, my name is Clint Jackson. I'm the student pastor here. And again, just so excited that you are here, especially if you're here in person. But even if you're joining us online, maybe you're watching on YouTube or Facebook or some other means. Thank you for taking the time out of your morning, uh, afternoon, whenever you're watching this, uh, to join us today. Um, if you are new with us today, especially if you are a first time guest, I would like for you to do me a favor. There is a number on the screen behind me. If you would text the letters HBC to that number, what that will do is that would send you a link. And if you click on that link, it will send a very brief questionnaire to your phone. And if you'll fill that out and submit it, that, that questionnaire would go directly to me this week. And, and what it will do is it'll just give me an opportunity to connect with you. 
nothing overbearing, just be able to find a way to get you plugged into to particular ministries here at Highland. Maybe you have specific prayer requests, or maybe you have some questions uh, of me or some of the staff about some of the things that we're doing. That just allows us to connect with you. Um, if you're like, I'm, I'm not big on texting, or I'm definitely not going to text in church, you know what? That's fine. You should have been handed one of these as you came in, a worship guide. There is a part of that that you can tear off and fill out. Um, I, I, sometimes I try to do that for you up here and I rip them, so I'm not going to do that. But if, if you'll fill that out for me and if you'll drop it off in the offering box as you leave this morning, it's one of the boxes in the foyer. Um, again, that'll land on my desk over the next couple of days. And, and just like with the text, it'll give me the opportunity to connect with you. Um, all that being said, again, thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today. I know there are so many other things you could have done. It's a beautiful summer day, but you have prioritized the worshiping of our Heavenly Father. So thank you so much for that. That being said, I would love to pray over us as we continue our time of worship together today. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you and, and we thank you, Lord God for who you are, for what you have done, for what you are doing in this place and what you will do in our lives. Lord, we worship you because you are the only thing worthy of our worship. And this morning, my prayer is that our worship would be sincere. It would not just be the recitation of words that we see on the screen. It would not just be listening to a sermon, but we would desire to glorify you with our life today, this morning, and moving forward. If there is anyone in this building, anybody watching online who has not made the decision to follow you, Lord, I pray that you would convict them so deeply, so heavy, heavily, that they would not be able to continue to say no to you. Lord, I pray that we are obedient to whatever it is that you have called us to do, whatever decision you've called us to make, and whatever step you have called us to make. Lord, we love you, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we continue worshiping and sing? There's just something about that name.
to worship. And God should receive all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for everything that happens in our life. So would you join together this morning corporately and sing this next part and let your praises rise straight to him. Would you sing with us?
for that gospel truth. We have sang the gospel already this morning, haven't we? Amen, indeed. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'm so glad that you're here with us. Go ahead and turn with me to the book of Amos. Amos is where we're going to be this morning. It's a small book in the Old Testament, uh, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Uh, if you don't know where those are, it's on page 768. If it's not the same in your Bible, then just go to the table of contents and you can work forward from there and find it. It's a small little book. Um, <clears throat> we'll deal with that in just a second. But as you're turning there, I want to share with you three brief stories as we begin thinking about Amos. The first is of two kids, and they happen to be my kids. Now, I don't use my kids as illustrations if you're already on your seats. I don't use my kids as illustrations as negative, but uh, only as positive illustrations. Um, and so uh, I've asked one of their um, uh, permission. I did not ask the other one. Evan, can I do that? Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is about Evan and Emma. Um, Emma is our oldest. Evan is the next. Um, and uh, this happened when they were a little younger in life. Uh, Emma was six, Evan was four, and we lived over in Reservoir Cove off of Highway 19 um, in a little uh, neighborhood there. And they wanted to do a lemonade stand uh, for whatever reason that particular day. It was sunny outside and they wanted to do this lemonade stand. So they did everything. They got all the ingredients together. They made the sign. They, took, they you know, worked as a team to get the table out there. Um, they made the lemonade. They worked the lemonade stand. It was all their idea. Now, I can't remember how many people came by the lemonade stand or if any actually came by the lemonade stand. I'm not sure. We lived in a cul-de-sac. It's not like that they, we had tons of people driving by. But I do remember why it, rem it just stayed in my mind so much because it was the why of why they did this stand. They literally had a sign up front that said, free lemonade, we want to tell you about Jesus. It's pretty awesome, right? Like, I don't, I don't remember how many people stopped by, but it's the fact that that blessed me and Rochelle so much that I still smile when I see that picture pop up every now and then. That's what I reminded of. It's like, here are two kids that love the Lord and they wanted to serve the Lord like that. Now, the second story is of a lady named Rosario Butterfield. Now, she was the quintessential postmodern secular feminist woman. Uh, she was a leftist lesbian professor at an Ivy League, League college. Um, this is her own terminology here. She was, as she says, an unlikely convert, as she calls herself, and she had what she calls a train wreck conversion. But now, if you look her up now, she is a Christian author, speaker, and homeschool mom. She didn't come to faith in Christ through a, an evangelistic rally, or even though she has an, an, a PhD in English lit, she didn't come through uh, literature or any print material like that. She came to faith in Christ through the hospitality of a pastor and his wife. They invited every week the single LGBT woman into their home weekly for a meal. And over time, she began to see the real Jesus around that table. Now, fast forward, apart from her work as an author and speaker, now she uses her home to reach her neighbors with the love of Jesus. She and her husband have neighbors over in the same way. Uh, weekly for supper. They've even turned their not so spare bedroom into a bedroom for guests that need help. And she writes, we realized that our home, it wasn't a castle. It was an incubator and a hospital. A quote from one of her books called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. She writes this, let God use your home, apartment, dorm room, front yard, community gymnasium, or garden for the purpose of making strangers into neighbors and neighbors into family, because that is the point, building the church and living like a family, the family of God. Third story, William Carey. He's known as the father of the modern mission movement. He was born in England in 1761. He died in 1864. He gave 41 years of his life to mission work in India. He worked for social reform while he was there. He preached the gospel while he was there. But in 41 years and a country with millions in it at that time, he only saw 700 people come to faith in Christ. Why did he do it? Here's what he says when he's writing against, in England, the lack of mission involvement in his day. Kerry writes, 
multitudes sit at ease and give themselves no concern about the far greater part of their fellow sinners who to this day are lost in ignorance and idolatry. My question in these three stories are, what do each of these people have in common? They're leading much different lives in much different time frames, doing different things. What do these people have in common? Here's one way to say it. Gospel urgency leads to mission fervency. Gospel urgency leads to mission fervency. Here's another way to say it. Loving God leads to loving other people. Or if you were here Wednesday night, Pastor Jay, let me remind you what he said. He says, love meets the need. Would you agree with that? That all through the Bible, no matter where we see, is that God wants us to love him and then love others. That love meets the need. Whether you are six and a four-year-old, whether you are a 30-something-year-old uh, connected English lit professor who is not living anything remotely like what the Bible says, or whether you are a, a 19th century missionary pioneer, love meets the needs. Say that with me. Love meets the needs. Well, let's look at what happens in just a moment because Jesus said in Mark 12 that the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart or basically with all you are and then to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving our neighbors naturally flows from loving God. We know that. We've heard that. But are we doing that? And if we're not, what does God think about that? Look at Amos chapter Five, beginning in verse 18. Word of the Lord says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me burnt offerings with, and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your hearts, I will not listen. But let justice roll like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amos was a prophet with a very unique calling. He was a prophet in southern Israel. At this time in Israel's history, the kingdom was in two, uh, divided into two kingdoms. Israel was in the northern kingdom with ten tribes, and primarily Judah was in the south, um, and they had the south, the southern kingdom. Amos was not a lifelong prophet. He didn't go to the school of the prophets or anything like that. He was a sheep farmer. He was a blue-collar worker like many of you guys in here. And God called him and then commissioned him to go north to the northern kingdom and to prophesy against what they were doing. See, what they were doing, the indictment was that they had perverted justice and had no righteousness among them. As God's people, they were to be righteous, but they were not living in righteousness. They were not acting in righteous ways. They lived on easy street with no care for the marginalized in their society. They had no heart for their neighbors who didn't have as much uh, money as they had or as much power and connection as they had. They were not compassionate and loving toward widows and orphans and others who had no voice. In fact, when we look at the indictment, Israel's love was based on what others could do for them, not what they could do for others. See, the way we love people who can't do anything for us, who can't give us anything in return, that we expect nothing from, is a picture of our view of how God has loved us. It is a picture of the gospel. So if we're not loving our neighbors, if, then the problem isn't our neighbors, is it? The problem is inside of us. If we're not reaching out to those who have no voice, reaching out to those who can do nothing in return for us, the problem is not them. The problem, God says, is with our own hearts. So what I want to show you are, is three things here that change in our lives because of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished that will then cause us, it will overflow out of our life and into the life of others, whether people can do anything for us in return or not. 
So the first change that we see because of Jesus is found in verses 18 through 20, that Jesus changes the way we view time. Jesus changes the way we view time. Look at verses 18 through 20. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? Jesus changes the way we view time. Time is the greatest commodity that we have because usually there are some times where we hear, hey, can you give this or can you do this? And people say, well, I don't have enough money or I don't know about if I can give to that. But people always say, well, I'm busy. I've got things to do. There are things over here that I need done. But not only in a personal amount of time, but in our eschatological, our end time view of time itself, look at what's happening here. When God says, whoa, it's not good. It's not like the Yosemite Sam on the camel, whoa. This is not the guy on the horse telling the horse to stop. This is, be warned, Israel. Watch out, Israel. You're heading the wrong way. Caution, caution, caution. So what do they need to be warned about? Well, there were those in Israel, leaders and others, who desired the day of the Lord to come. And to come quickly, to come swiftly. What is the day of the Lord? Well, the day of the Lord is God's final judgment. We see that all through the Bible, that God gives us graciously the news that judgment is coming, that there will be a day when God will return and will right every wrong. He will judge every thought, every action, every intention of our hearts. Everything seen and unseen will be on that day. All of us, no matter who you are or when the person has lived in history, will stand before the Lord. From Adam all the way to the last person that is born, everyone will stand before the Lord. That's the day of the Lord. And here, these people, they desired it to come. They wanted it to come. They were praying that it would come. They wanted God's judgment to come over their enemies and onto their enemies. They wanted God's judgment to come so that they could have it even easier in God's consummated kingdom. They wanted God's judgment so that they could get revenge on their neighbors. They wanted God's judgment to come really in a very selfish manner. Should we want God's judgment to come? Well, the Bible says yes and no, we should. And we need to be cautious about it. I mean, in the New Testament, we have a Greek word, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. So the ends, the uh, revelation ends with that word several times that we long for Jesus to come. But if we and our neighbors are not right with the Lord as the people in Israel were not right, then we don't want Jesus to come yet. There is a sense of, yes, Jesus, bring your justice, but there's also a sense of, but not yet, God, because there's so much work to do. God says to Israel here, you do not know what you're asking for. Why, in the condition of your heart right now, why would you have the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord's God's final judgment is not a party. It is a slaughter. Just read Revelation. It is darkness. It is not light. There is terror around every corner. It is a day of doom and gloom because God will overthrow his enemies once and for all. So again, in one sense, we long for the day of the Lord to come so that God's kingdom would be consummated. And, but yet with every piece of bad news, we constantly hear people cry, Yes, Lord, when are you going to take us out of this mess? For the rapture, that God would take us away. But if you and I aren't careful in our doctrine of the rapture, it will slip slowly into what we call Christian escapism. God, just take me out of this mess. God, surely you wouldn't leave me in this mess. Look at me, God, I I come to church all the time. Surely you're not going to make me go through this stuff. God, may your day come. And yet, at the same time that we are thinking those thoughts, God is trying 
to point out that he's giving more time for more people to come to him. That's what Second Peter says, 3 and 9. Does it not? He says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. The day of God's judgment will come. But praise God that he is patient in his judgment so that more people could hear the gospel, so that more people could experience salvation and eternal life in him. Let me ask you a question. As we pray things like that, especially as we see around our city, I mean, I've seen it on Facebook, I've I've seen it, we hear it. We long for God to come back and right all the wrongs, and we do on one hand. But what if, what if God came back while you were still in sin? What if God decided to come back before you came to know him as Savior? Aren't you thankful? Surely I am thankful that God was patient for me to hear the gospel, even as a 12-year-old kid. What if God would have came when I was 11? And yet I knew right from wrong. I knew that Jesus was the way, and I had not received him as Savior yet. What if he did that with you? Aren't we grateful (laughs) that someone shared the gospel with us instead of only wanting to leave earth for heaven and could care less about us. I know I am. God's judgment day, it will come one day. But Jesus changes the way we view time. Instead of viewing time as a countdown to God taking care of our enemies and we get back to easy street, we view time as more opportunity to meet the needs of our neighbors and to share the gospel. Jesus changes the way we view time. But the second area that Jesus changes is that he changes the way we view God. Look at this, verses 21 through 23. He says, I hate, man, what strong words God says. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your hearts. I will not listen. Now, let me put this little thought in here for you. If you are new or you haven't been in a while and you're thinking, man, something must have happened for him to be preaching this stuff today. That's not the case. Y'all know as well as I do, we have a schedule that we are following that is taking us through the Bible. It's been laid out since last year. I'm just taking the next one in line. And here we are today. So this is God's word to our body of Christ today, or the body of Christ here today. And so God has these extremely strong and sobering words. So God here moves from how their hearts interpret the Lord's final judgment to their hearts worshiping him the wrong way. Get a sense what God is saying. It's not hard, but listen to it again. God says, I hate, I hate, I despise your feasts. He's not going to accept their sacrifices. He's not going to accept their worship. He's not even going to look at them. He's not going to look at their direction. God is turning his back. He's tired of hearing the incessant worship songs that have no follow through in them. He's tired of the people coming in on Sunday, living like the church on Sunday, talking like the church on Sunday, and then living like the world on Monday through Saturday. God says, I'm tired of it. You are wearing me out. Israel viewed God as a God that they could manipulate. Now let that sink in. Because if we're not careful, we do the same things with God. We can try to manipulate God, but God cannot be manipulated like that. He is God and we are not. They could continue doing the religious actions, but their hearts were far from God. They checked off the boxes of what church people do, but God couldn't care less. I love how Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrased this section. Listen to this. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. 
I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Now, I am so thankful that we have a worship leader and a worship team and choir that leads us in gospel-centered, Christ-exalting songs. But the question still remains, even in those moments that we sing songs like that, are you singing to God? Or are you mouthing the words that are on the screen? Are you singing to the Lord from your heart? Or are you just doing what you always do when you come in? Because that's what we do. Where is your heart when you worship, when we sing these great songs of the faith? When's the last time that you came to church because you wanted to be in the presence of God with God's people? When's the last time that you saw God as a God that wanted a relationship instead of a God who just wanted some religious effort? Religious effort was never what God wanted for Israel, not from day one, not even now. In fact, listen to this real quick. This is how, this is a a parable of how God found Israel. Ezekiel 16, just reading three verses. He says, and as for your birth, On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No eye pitied you, pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out on the open field for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. So he says, when I saw you, Israel, as a new nation, you were like, a, a, an aborted child that somebody threw in the trash can and walked away. That's how I found you. And when I passed by, verse six, he says, and I saw you wallowing in your blood. I said to you in your blood, live. And I said to you in your blood, live. It wasn't religious effort that got God to notice Israel, was it? It was by his grace and his compassion of why God noticed Israel. But it wasn't just an Old Testament thing because Jesus says virtually the same thing in a different way to the Pharisees. Religious effort was not enough for the Pharisees either in Jesus's day. Matthew 9, 10 through 13, as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, That's Jesus. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. Listen to this. He's quoting Hosea here. I desire mercy and not sacrifice for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Acting religious was never, ever, ever a part of God's plan for his people. If it were, we would have no use for Jesus. Jesus would never have had to come. God the Father has revealed himself in his son. And Jesus came to earth. He lived a perfect life for every single one of us. And he, he, he died a sacrificial death for each one of us. He paid our sin penalty, not because we deserved it, not because we were better than other people, not because we could give him something other people couldn't. God sent his son simply because he loves you because he loves us. God loves us enough to send Jesus to die for us. And we cannot pretend that our religious actions will somehow appease a holy God. Only faith in his son, Jesus Christ, can please God, nothing else. So Jesus not only changes the way we view time, but Jesus also changes the way we view God. He is a gracious, merciful, compassionate, abounding in love, slow to anger God. He loves us and he wants to give us life. Thirdly, lastly, Jesus also changes the way we view others. Jesus changes the way we view others. Look at the last verse, verse 24 here. 
So he says these indicting statements here, and then he turns it around. He says, but these things are true of you now, but here's what needs to be true of you. Here's the change that needs to result. Here's the response that I long for in you, Israel. But let justice roll like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. See, Israel, they were great at talking the talk. Hurry up, go get them, God. They walked the religious walk. We showed up to church. We sing the songs. We gave our money. We made it to lunch before 12. We're good. Keep checking the list, right? But what God really wanted for Israel is the same thing he wants for us, to have a heart like his. To have a heart like his. God says, but let justice roll down like waters. Like a swollen river, Israel was to be full of justice. Why? Because God is a God of justice. So we need to ask the question in these two phrases here, of these two words, what is, it, what is justice and what is righteousness? And what does it mean to have justice and righteousness? Well, the, the word here in Hebrew is mishpat, and it can mean the time of judgment, it can mean or the act or deciding of judgment. God's justice in the Old Testament, as we see it worked out, it's always in giving favor to those who are unprotected people in society. That God uses his resources and his power to affect and change the lives and give life to those who have no resources and who have no power. And he expects us to do the same. We can do it on the abortion front and the pro-life front, that here are innocent children, babies, fetuses in the womb that have no voice for themselves, and they need voices to speak up for them in truth to give them literal life. But it can also be our homeless community. It can be the drug addicts in our own neighborhood. The door swings both ways. That God wants us to be full of justice, not to just one people, kind of people, but to all people who need life. So when's the last time we initiated a conversation with someone like that? Or that we reached out to maybe that single mom and just asked if she needed help? When's the last time that we came along some, uh, aside someone and said, hey, do you need some help with this? Now, I'm not saying don't use common sense and, and be uh, unsafe about anything. Obviously we do those things, but we can't let those ideas keep us from actually being full of justice and how God wants us to act. I mean, are these things easy? No, they're not. <laughs> they are against every fiber of our flesh. Our flesh tells us, it leads us to only help those who can help ourselves. Many churches, man, we see it in churches, right? That they only sometimes reach out to those people who can make their church look better, more financially stable, more pleasing to more people just like them. Even churches can do that. But God works his power for those who are powerless and he has called us to do the same. But secondly, he talks about righteousness, righteousness like an ever flowing stream like a stream that never, ever runs dry, that Israel was to live in righteousness, not in their own righteousness, but in God's righteousness. This word is tzedek, right? It's this Hebrew word that means fulfilling the demands of the relationship. What it doesn't mean, and it doesn't mean that it's an ethical statement, that they're trying to be right. And it also doesn't mean an inner motivation. They're, they're, something motivates them to do right. That's not what this word means. It means that it literally means fulfilling the demands of the relationship. And since they couldn't ever fulfill it, guess what? The relationship fulfillment was never on them to begin with. Who was it on? God. It was always on God. In fact, God is the one who is faithful to fulfill the covenant relationship with Israel. And yet, and then Isaiah says, and our righteousness is like filthy rags. If that's the truth, and it is, then how in the world can we walk in righteousness? How can we be righteous? Well, we do the same thing in the Old Testament, but it's revealed now in the person of Jesus. 
is that just as they were to follow God and his uh, desire for them and his commands for them, that it was his righteousness that they were living in here in the New Testament, when Jesus comes in, we need Jesus's righteousness. And since we can depend on God to fulfill the covenant relationship in the Old Testament, we can surely depend on Jesus to fulfill the covenant relationship for us as revealed in the New Testament. I mean, that's what he said in the Passover, right? This is the new covenant poured out for you in my blood, is that we come into this new covenant, this new relationship with God through the sacrificial act of Jesus. And that through faith, we put on Jesus's righteousness. It's like putting on a new robe. It's putting on a new cloak. We're to put off the old self. We're to put on the new self, which is created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That's Ephesians 4, 22 and 24. So we're to put on Jesus. We're to rely on Jesus, not on our own good works. So how does justice and righteousness work together then? Well, here it is, listen, it's all about Jesus. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus's work, not our work. And so as we walk with Jesus, as we stay connected with Jesus, John 15, we will be more inclined to seek out those who need him. That as we continue to build our relationship uh, with Christ and he fills us more and more of this Holy Spirit, what is gonna come out is the heart of Jesus. It is spilling over into the lives of other people that are around us, no matter what they look like, no matter where they live, no matter what they vote like, no matter what they smell like, no matter who they are. When Jesus fills us, he is going to come out. Love meets the needs. This is the gospel, is it not? That we who are helpless and powerless, dead in our sins, and yet God made us alive through Jesus Christ. So if God has treated our helpless estate like this, then surely in his power and with his presence, we could do the same with other people. Jesus changes the way we view others. Now, we began with three brief stories. And these people were not and are not perfect, but these three stories reveal people who love Jesus or others simply because they love Jesus. My question as we begin to, to, to land the plane is, if that's their story, and some of their stories are still being written, if that's their story, what does your story read like? What does your story look like? What would people say about your life? Looking from the outside. Do you have moments that you're radically loving others because you love Jesus? What will the story of Highland be? What is our story that is being written right now? I mean, what are people gonna say about us in 50 years from now? Are they gonna be able to, to put their hands uh, like on a, on, a, on, a, on a kind of a historical graph and say, man, look what this church is doing. They did this and they did this and they did this and it's not about them, but look, man, they are reaching people. It doesn't matter who they are. Look, they did this over here this year and this summer missions, they did this. These people couldn't give anything back in return. Most of these people didn't even come back to church, but they still did it because Jesus is worth it. Which by the way, let me say this because I have not said this yet since we started Summer of Missions. You wanna know how we, when we look at mission involvement and we determine worth, be careful that you're not determining worth, both money and participation and how many people come back to this church. If that's the case, you have the wrong scorecard. You have us at the center of this and that is not the case. Jesus has called us to the nations, to this city, to our neighborhood, whether or not anybody comes to this church. We still go because he sent us and he's empowered us to it. And they need life, just like we needed life. We're praying that God fills this place up though, man. We're praying that God gives us a great harvest. But even if he doesn't, it's still worth it. It's still worth every dime we spend and it's still worth every amount of our time we give. It's still worth it worth it. What is the story of this church 50 years from now? Are we going to be a church that is so full of Jesus that we are just spilling over into our neighborhood, into 
the lives of others into our city. I pray that we are. I believe that's why God has us here for this moment in history. That's why God has every church where he has them, to be gospel lighthouses, affecting, impacting the culture that God has had them in. This is what Summer of Missions is about. VBS is just about to come around the corner. That's what that is about. Man, if you're not connected in those areas, you are missing a huge blessing. Wednesday nights, man, God is showing up. He's showing out and people are being blessed and people are being called into service. I love what God's doing here. And I'm encouraging you, keep following Jesus. Keep filling up on the Holy Spirit. Keep allowing the Holy Spirit to fill you so that this just overflows into the life of other people. But before we go, I do need to ask the question, has Jesus changed you personally yet? We can talk all day long about, you know, being filled with Jesus, but has Jesus filled you yet? Have you given your life to Jesus? He is the one who loves you. He died for you. And today he is alive for you. If you have never trusted in Christ as your savior, this is your purpose in life. God created you. And he wants to be in a relationship with you. And since God is life, separation from him is death. And so without God in your life, you're just going to experience death over and over and over and over. And one day, eternal death, because judgment day is going to come. But today, God can change that. God can change your eternal destiny. So if you've never trusted in Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, in just a few moments, I'm going to be down front, Abby and the worship team and the instruments are gonna play and we're gonna sing, that's your cue. I'd love to talk with you more about that, pray with you, whatever you need, I'm gonna be down front here. Maybe God's calling you to another decision. Be obedient to what God is doing in our life so that he can have full control, that he can fill us and that that spills over into the lives of other people. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Abby, you come. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you've uh, already began here this morning, what you're going to continue to do throughout uh, the rest of this day and this week. Lord, we give you this time. Lord, consecrate. we consecrate it to you. We ask that you would take charge of it, that you would move in the lives of people. Um, Lord, that you would give them uh, the, the boldness to, to step out in faith and, and make the decision that you are calling them to make. So even in the response time, Lord, we put you center stage and we give you glory for what you're going to do. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. What you see. Just because you didn't come forward does not mean that you still don't have a decision to make. Um, every one of us has a decision to make. When God's word is given, his word, he has promised that his word will not return void. So God is uh, getting us to take his word and to live it outside of these doors. So every one of us, whether you come up here and have a response or not, every one of us has a response to make to God's word. Are we going to be compassionate and merciful to people that he is sending us to? And so we have different ways you can do that. VBS starts June 20th through the 24th, um, and 
if you haven't signed up yet, we need more workers. We probably need some, uh, um, uh, some more supplies. So please see Libby uh, for that or the, the table down at the gathering area. And then our Wednesday night worship services, they are going great. Looking forward to another wonderful uh, Wednesday night service uh, this week as well. It's in here at 6 o'clock. We eat at 5. Um, and also Summer of Missions is coming up. We will be at uh, the Wesley House. Uh, there's three times you can sign up for, 9 through 11 is Fix a Bike. So if you can turn a chain and spray some WD-40, we got something for you to do, okay? Um, and you're going to be at uh, right across the street from... Um and the Wesley House is the playground for Jesus, uh, and the a pavilion there, that's where you'll be. And so uh, if you can help with that, let Clint know. And then the other two times are grocery give-out times, uh, 12.30 to 2, and then 2 to 4 o'clock. And you can also go by the Summer Missions table and sign that up if you haven't yet, or let Clint know as well. All right, and then um, I think that's it, right? Good. I always have to check, you know, because every time I, I just miss something. All right. Look, we love you so much, and we are praying for you as you walk out of these doors that God is going to use you this week, give you the boldness to be his hands and feet this week. We love you. You are blessed in Christ, and you're dismissed.